we're so pleased tonight to have Father Morris join us again to talk about a first and second Thessalonians. We look forward to it and welcome Father Morris. Thank you so very much, Mother Lyons. Um, if we could just pause a moment and we'll open with one of the, the traditional collects for St. Paul. O oh God, who through the preaching of the blessed apostle Paul has caused a new light of the gospel to shine within the, throughout the world, grant we beseech you that we having his wonderful conversion and remembrance may show forth our thankfulness for the same by following the holy doctrine which he taught through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 So <clears throat> please interrupt, whistle, wave, wave, get my attention if you have any questions at any point. Don't, don't uh, think like you have to take, take notes and wait till the end. If, you're, if something's, although I'm happy to, to discuss it uh, at the conclusion, but if you have a question during the course of the talk, please don't hesitate. Um, if I can just share a screen here, I want to just sort of set the scene. Uh, Thessalonica, as you can see, is up here in the northeast corner of what's now mainland Greece. And in the in St. Paul's time, this, this area was called, it wasn't called Greece, it was called Macedonia. And then down here was Achaia. So Thessalonica was a very important city along the coast. You could see ships would come along the coast here, start to sell things and, and buy things in Thessalonica, and then they would come down the coast here. And then not a lot of people realize this, but instead of going around here, because this was a very dangerous uh, part of the Mediterranean, what most ships would do is come through Corinth you can't see it on this map, but it's actually a, a, a canal here, that, that, an ancient canal that was dug. And so the ships would come through Corinth, which is the reason Corinth was such an important city, huge and um, kind of wild because it was uh, a real sailor's town. Um, <laughs> but uh, so the ships would come through uh, Cor past Corinth and then through this and then out into the Ionian Sea here, and then they could either go up to this part of Italy or around to that part of Italy. But that's kind of how the shipping worked uh, in the Mediterranean. And you could, you could sail from, I'd say, late spring around Pentecost time through uh, early fall. You really didn't want to be sailing on the Mediterranean too much after Yom Kippur. Um, because of the winter storms were so made the whole th the water so dangerous. So pretty much wherever you found yourself, if you were on a big trip, if you found your, wherever you found yourself in mid-September, that's where you spent the winter because uh, you, the boats just wouldn't um, travel until the, the, the spring again. So any questions about where, where, where Thessalonica is and what's going on here? No questions. Just uh, I just want to say what a great map this is. Terrific. It's, it's really one of the most clear maps of that region in that time that I've ever seen. It is very handy. So say how, how long did it take to get from Thessalonia down to Corinth? Was that a long trip, a long journey? Well, it, I mean, it would be a few days on a boat. It could be quite a trek if you were walking. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 was, it was probably about a week, I would guess, to get from Thessalonica to Corinth on a boat, depending on the weather. Yeah, so, yeah, so there was no mail service, you know. Any, anytime you sent a letter, you had, to have, you had to either pay somebody to take it or you had to have a friend who was going, going there. So if St. Paul uh, was in was actually in, in Athens when he wrote the letters to the, to the Thessalonians. So he wrote them in Athens and then presumably, then he, he sent, he got, he had a friend take them and the friend would probably uh, go on a boat and it would take about a week for the letter to get delivered uh, to Thessalonica, which is faster than most US Postal Service works nowadays, I have to say. <laughs> Okay, 
So um, Thessalonica was founded in 315 BC by one of the generals of Alexander the Great. It was, like I said, a major east-west trading route. It was a huge commercial city, very important uh, in the first century. Um, it was always an independent city, which means um, that it was allied with Rome, but it wasn't directly under Rome's thumb the same way that, that a lot of the other cities were. So it still maintained um, some independence in its self-governing and its own decision-making. Um, what's important for us in, in reading Thessalonians is that St. Paul is writing to uh, his, this parish in Thessalonica. Uh, it's, ve it's very popular to talk about gods of the underworld in Thessalonica. Everybody in Thessalonica was concerned about how to save themselves after death and how to guarantee a safe passage through the underworld to a good place, whatever that might be, uh, on the other side of death. So the mystery cults that were dedicated to the gods of the underworld were very important. And everybody was always talking about the gods of the underworld and different, who, who was the best god that, to get, you know, to bribe, who, who, was, who did you want to get on the good side with, and how could you guarantee yourself a safe passage through the underworld uh, after you die. So that's reflected in the first and second letters to the Thessalonians. There's a lot of concern about the dead, um, just because that was in the air in Thessalonica. Um, just to sort of round it out, just so you know, later on in the Middle Ages, Thessalonica had, was a, had a lot of Slavic speakers. It was a, a lot of people who came south from what we now can think of Russia and Eastern Europe settled there. And the, the first evangelists and translators to the Slavic lands came from Thessalonica. Cyril and Methodius, who were brothers, um, and did the first translations of the Bible and the church services into Slavonic, came from Thessalonica. Um, and even today, it's a very important university town with, with a very important theology department and a very famous language department. So people go to Thessalonica to study theology, and they go to Thessalonica to study Greek. And so you hear about it still quite a bit. So the, this first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, um, he, let me just so, let me think here. I don't want to repeat everything I said last week, but I want to catch you all up. So St. Paul visits Thessalonica and he preaches uh, two or three times in the synagogue and there are riots. The, his, some people are really enthusiastic about what he has to preach, and some people are really furious with what he has to preach. So he gets out of town fast, and he um, heads to Athens, and he's followed by some of the Thessalonian Jews, some of the leaders of the Thessalonian Jewish community, who sort of follow him, trying to track him down to stop him from preaching this horrendous new uh, doctrine that, that they've heard him talk about. And so he gets to Athens, and he, while he's sort of hiding out in Athens, he writes these letters, these two letters back to Thessalonica. Uh, probably, as far as we can tell, around the year, this first letter is written around the year 50, and the other letter was written the next year, you know, in the year 51 or maybe 52. First Thessalonians, the main part of the letter is chapters 2, 3, and 4. And this is, this, is the, this is the first letter he wrote uh, in the New Testament. He didn't really probably expect things to get circulated around the way they did. So when he realized that different parishes and different cities were passing around his letters, he added chapter one and chapter five just to round it out uh, to make it applicable, more generally applicable to everybody else. But the, the original core of the letter that he wrote to the Thessalonians was chapters two, three, and, four, and part of four. Um, although he, he added, the, the added parts were not added by somebody else. He added those himself. So let's see. Any questions so far? Again? So what kind of, I, I talked last week about uh, some parts of uh, chapter one and chapter two. We can come back to those if you have any questions. Um, I want to sort of, and we can come, if we have time, I'll come back to some parts of chapter two and chapter three, but I want to skip 
to chapter four right now, just to make, because that's real, where some of the really interesting stuff happens. And so I want to make sure we have time to, to go over that. Now, chapter three, which is, uh, he sort of, it sort of grounds out he, he, with one of his usual uh, prayers for the Thessalonians. And then he starts out again. Um, with so sort of, he's, he starts over again uh, in this uh, first part of chapter four. He's clearly answering some questions. He, he's written what he wants to say. And now he's going to answer the questions that they sent to him saying, you know, could you tell us more about this? So he says in the beginning of chapter four, finally, brothers, we beg, we, uh, the plural uh, person, uh, we beg and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God, that you abound more and more. So he wants them to sort of keep on doing what they've been doing, keep on the, uh, the same route. He, he then goes on to urge them to, um, to follow the sexual morality that he taught them when he was there. Presumably the parish was a, was a mix of converted Jews and converted Gentiles. So the, this, the, the sexual morality rules would have been familiar to the Jewish context but they would have been um, brand new to the Greek and Roman converts. Um, they, the Jewish and then Christian attitudes to sex were very different from the Greek and Roman attitudes. So th that took a big adjustment for people. Um, and then he tells them to just sort of live quietly and mind your own business, work hard. And he's really stressing um, how Christianity is not just another philosophy, which was popular, and of course, in the Greek cultural world. Um, a lot of the philosophers said that you should live quietly, but in order to live quietly, they said that you should go, you should leave town and go live out in the wilderness and not work, and, but then come back to town and beg for food. And so what St. Paul is saying is that that's not us. We, we, we should live quietly and mind our own business, but stay in the city. Don't go out into the countryside and then expect other people to support you. And that comes up two or three times, both in this letter and in Second Thessalonians, where he says, you know, anybody that doesn't want to work shouldn't eat. That you should, don't indulge freeloaders. And that, <laughs> that they are not to be, don't encourage freeloaders. And oh. that, that because, so he's, he's making the distinction between Christians and the other, the other philosophers who pretend to be, and the, the uh, thing about the other philosophers is that they, they pretend to not depend on the world. They pretend to be so free, but they actually are completely dependent on other people to support them. So uh, he's saying that's not us. Then in verse 13, he says, we, again, again referring to himself as plural, we do not want you to be ignorant, my brothers and sisters, concerning those who have fallen asleep euphemism for died, so that you do not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we tell you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will in no way precede those who have fallen asleep. We don't, we don't get a, a leg up. We're not, we're, we don't get extra points because we're still alive. Um, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with God's trumpet. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive, those of us who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, comfort, which means strengthen, one another with these words. Now you've probably heard this before. This is one of the standard readings at funerals. And if you have been, if you've been paying attention in the daily office the last week or so, we've been reading 1 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians 15, which is kind of a long chapter and is also one of the traditional readings at funerals. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is like an expanded version of some, of some of what he's talking about here in 1 Thessalonians chapter four. 
So he's, he says, um, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. So they've clearly written to ask questions. And I don't want you to grieve like the other people, the outsiders, the, the people that are so concerned about the underworld gods uh, who have no hope because they, they're, um, they don't know what's coming. We know what's coming because of, of Christ. Now, just about the same time that St. Paul is writing this, there's a handbook for parish churches being written in Antioch that we now call the Didache. And it's a, it, it tells us a lot about how parish churches functioned at about the same time. And in the Didache, it says that there are three signs, three, there are three signs that will mark the return of the Lord. When these things happen, you know that uh, Jesus is about to come back and says, uh, the sign, the Didache says that there will be a sign in heaven. Christ will appear with his angels. There will be a trumpet sound from heaven and the, res and the dead will rise. Now, all of those things would be pretty flabbergasting if you saw any one of them, but all three of them together are pretty, sh you know, it's not just that Jesus is coming soon, it's that Jesus is here now. When the dead rise, you hear the trumpet and you see Christ descending from the skies. Now, this is St. Paul's, um, so, so, so these things that St. Paul is talking about in First Thessalonians are kind of the common Christian expectation of what the end of the world would look like. And he's not writing to give a timeline. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen so that you can have a map about the end of the world. He's just saying, he's just trying to reassure them that whether you're dead or alive, you will be saved. That uh, it, 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 you don't have, um, you're not at any disadvantage one way or the other, which seems to be what they were, what they may have been asking about. Um, he says that this is the word of the Lord that he's telling them. And we don't have anything in the gospel that says anything like this. So what we think the word of the Lord means is that this was uh, and it's based on a prophecy, which basically means a really great sermon that somebody preached once and really got traction and got repeated and repeated and repeated. And, and sort of took hold of everybody's imagination. And, and that's kind of what formed their uh, expectations of what, about what was going on. At this time, there were still prophets or people called prophets in the Christian community. And basically, uh, if you compare these early Christian prophets to the Old Testament prophets, the things they have in common are that they are great, great preachers and that their sermons get written down and passed around and are, real, are really considered authoritative expositions of God's will. And so these inspired sermons uh, that the prophets gave seem to have been the basis for, for some of what St. Paul is talking about here. Yes, Mother Lyles, you're, you're muted. Excuse me. Uh, do you think it might have been, an, uh, a, if, if, we, if we imagine a sermon that Paul was influenced by or referring to or influenced by. Um, do you think it might have been on the words of Jesus when he said the Son of Man will come again in glory with his angels? It would come again with his angels in clouds of glory. Yes, and I think maybe, that's... maybe that whole image, um, that whole visual image was expanded. Yes. Yeah, I think somebody was then expanding that. Mm -hmm. Some of the things Jesus said about there will be a sign in heaven, but he didn't really say what that sign would be. Um, and so he's, people sort of well, tried to think, well, what, what might that look like? And sort of unpacked it. And definitely, yeah, the, 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 the parables of Matthew 25 would be a great subject mm -hmm. for a sermon, uh, an inspired yeah. sermon like that. And I just, so this, I just wanted to, I'm sorry, before we go on, I just wanted yeah. to shout out uh, Luca Signorelli's fresco cycle in Orvieto. Uh, if anybody wants to Google that, and look at the, his stunningly terrifying images of the dead rising from the ground. Orvieto, Signorelli, look it up. <laughs> okay. I That's think it, in, in, a lot, in a lot of the images of the resurrection of the dead, you have the righteous coming up out of the ground looking beautiful and the damned 
coming out looking really hideous. Yeah. Um, but it's really interesting. This is a complete side note. It's really interesting. The the barrels or the caves or the niches in the ground that the damned are coming out of are labeled. And the labels really are sometimes fascinating. Just, you know, what was considered horrible sin in the time and place where that fresco was painted? Because sometimes, you know, it's the fornicators, it's the thieves, but then it's also a merchant who put his thumb on the scale. Right. And it's and it's the the tavern owner who who who, who watered down the beer, right. and and it's all these really interesting um, categories of what's considered sinful behavior. So, so yeah, looking those things up will be well, well worth your time. So this idea about the angel blowing the trumpet that's kind of become like a standard thing in Western culture now. We we can talk about an angel blowing his trumpet. Gabriel, blow your horn on Broadway. Everybody knows what that's talking about. Um, and uh, if you look really carefully at the top of churches like St. John the Divine, you will see an angel with a trumpet on the very tippy top of the apse on the east end of the church. And the, that that's often consider, the, traditionally considered to be Gabriel is going to be the one to come and blow his trumpet at the end of time. And the angels are often considered to be the heavenly deacons. The, the deacons in, on earth are the ones who sort of give directions because they tell people, stand up, pay attention to the reading. They say, bow down, kneel and say your prayers. They say, bow your head before receiving communion. They tell the people who are preparing to be baptized, catechumens depart. They say, close the doors and lock them. Uh, they, the deacons say, pray for this and pray for that and pray for the other. They read the gospel, which is giving the Lord's instructions for how to live. So basically the angel, the, the deacons are always giving instructions. And the angels are the heavenly deacons because they're also giving instructions, especially Gabriel blowing his horn is giving the instruction, wake up all you dead people, uh, come up out of the graves, come up out of the ground. And if you're alive and he's giving them instructions, get ready because you're gonna be pulled up into the air. So that's, um, and oftentimes the angels are shown wearing deacon vestments uh, because of that. So this idea about the, the, the living who will be caught up, you know, pulled up into the air together with the dead um, towards the sky, this is not necessarily meant to be a piece of geography. Um, it's similar to in the, in the record of the Ascension where it says, Jesus lifted up his hands and blessed them and then was carried into glory. So in one sentence, you've got both literal history, he lifted up his hands and blessed them, and poetic metaphor, he was carried up into glory. Now later on in the Middle Ages, they forget that the second part of the sentence was poetic metaphor, and you, have, you end up having pictures of Jesus' feet sticking out of the clouds because they think that he was pulled up into the, into the sky. But he was taken up into glory, but the, the, the shining, the, the story says the shining cloud enveloped the mountain and Jesus just wasn't there in the cloud. And instead there were two angels who told the apostles, why are you standing around? What are you looking at? Go back to the city, wait for the Holy Spirit. You know, don't just stand here gawking, get to work. So in the same way, when St. Paul says that the living will be caught up into heaven. It's not so much that they, it's not geography that they're gonna be pulled up off the ground. It's, a, it's again, it's a poetic metaphor that they will be translated from, from one state that we think of as earthly to another state, which we think of as glorious. I think anybody who lived through the sixties uh, or went to college in the sixties knows what you mean. <laughs> Just, just saying. Don't quote me. <laughs> yes. At this, at this point, at this point, uh, is is Christian uh, belief or 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 inclination to to think that heaven is 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 on earth or is it totally separate? Is it? it, it it's, it's both and. It's, it's, okay. it, that there's, there's some expectation that um, 
at the end of time, the earth will be completely renewed and, th and, and this will become heaven. And other people who say that heaven is like a totally different dimension and yeah. that this, this dimension will vanish. And that's so no, by the time we get to the Middle Ages, you have the whole you know cosmology. But but I was just wondering at, at this time, yeah. if you look at at at, at revelations, it, it really is here. Right. It, and, and the idea that, that that the old that there's definitely been juxtaposition between the fallen earth or the, the, the earth as it was meant to be. Or Christ the is earth, new Adam. Right. The earth as it is, and then the earth restored. Mm -hmm. And I, and in those cases, I think the earth stands for this whole world, not, not just this particular piece of ground. This particular yes, piece and, of dirt. and all of creation, antique Christians believe, they, know they, they believe that all of creation was redeemed in Christ, not just human people, which kind of got to be the idea after the enlightenment, we, we, the humans began to, think, they began to think that human beings are the only ones that are redeemed, but antique people saw the whole creation, you know, rocks, and animals. Animal. There, was a, there was a lot of concern about animals. animals. Nature. Yep. Yeah. So, and a lot of things that Jesus said about uh, when. I think Larry you know, this, has a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but Larry. Isn't, it just isn't sort of the context of these letters the kind of mindset of the early believers was that Christ's return was happening very soon. And wasn't there a concern that those people who had died might miss out when Christ returns? Well, well, I, I, maybe it was before you got here. I was saying in Thessalonica, oh. particularly, there was just a concern about the cults for the dead were very popular. People were very concerned about the dead in general. Mm -hmm. And so this was just kind of in the air. People were always worried about this, the fate of the dead. And, I, and just like, you know, they were really... They were expecting Christ to return very soon, but it's like Christmas. You know, if you want something, you know, the last two weeks of December are the longest two weeks of the year if you're 10 years old. And when I was 10 or 11, December 24th, the after, that was the longest afternoon in the whole year. And it just dragged on and on and on and on and on. And so if you're really expecting and waiting and wanting Christ to return soon, even a delay of two weeks is a long time to wait. Yeah, so, so, it isn't that so, also, I think some scholars have speculated that also might have been what was behind this concern or this issue of people stopping work, not working, because mm -hmm. they thought that actually the, the return was happening yeah. very soon. Well, it's like Jonestown. Oh, why should I need to, why should I bother with the regular world? I'm right. just going to go off and twiddle my thumbs and, you know, wait for the Messiah. Um, but that never works. So, again, you know, it's not, that's, that's not an argument to say what's, what, what's often that's used as uh, ammunition for it. So, oh, this has, you know, this has to be something late. People are getting worried. Uh, it, it hasn't happened yet. It's been delayed X number of years. And I'm, I agree rather that this, this is a very early letter from like the year 50. And just because Jesus, and it, it, it's been 20 years, it's already been what, 20 years since the crucifixion. And that's a long time. So even, so this doesn't to say that people are getting anxious and waiting for something that they thought was going to happen 10 years ago already. Doesn't mean that the letter is late or that the Christians are, you know, that this is somehow, it doesn't mitigate against an early text, is what I'm trying to say. And two, I think another point that, that you made uh, before Larry joined us was that Paul addressed the people who stopped working and told them to get back to work. Yes. Yeah, two or three times in, in both of these letters. He's, you know, get, up, get up off your backside and get to work. Don't, don't uh, indulge. Uh, what did I say? Back, don't, don't, don't indulge. Uh, the people who just want to live off you. Um, yes, yeah, so, so that lot, must that that must have been happening a lot that he had to do enough. That. It was happening enough. enough. Yeah, interesting. It just it, you only need one or two to screw it up for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of times, because the angels at the ascension said, "See, Jesus just left you in glory, and when he comes back, he's going to come back the same way." 
So a lot of times those early depictions of the ascension double as early depictions of the second coming because you see Jesus in glory with the apostles and the mother of God and the angels. And it could, and, it, and nowadays in the books, the footnotes say ascension, but it could just as easily say second coming. And it's, it, it's a, it's a, that event is a bridge that's, that, that simultaneously is both the ascension and the second coming. And so in the same way, this idea that uh, we will be caught up into heaven doesn't, is, is like a translation from, from uh, earth as we now experience it, this stuff, and into glory. Uh, more, not that people are going to look up and see our feet sticking out of the clouds. Um, then he goes on to say in chapter five, concerning the times and the seasons, my brothers and sisters, you don't need anything to be written to you, uh, for you yourselves know well that the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. For when they are saying peace and safety, that's when sudden destruction comes upon them, like birth pangs on a pregnant woman, and they will in no way escape. But you, you clever Thessalonians, you're not in darkness that that, that, that day should overtake you like a thief. You are all like children of light and children of the day. So this idea that the day of the Lord, um, that's a common phrase that means a lot of different things. Uh, it's used in the Old Testament and it's used in the New Testament. It means that um, all the foreigners that oppress Israel will be punished. It means that all the unjust Israelites the ones that put their thumbs on the scale in the meat market, they will be punished and the oppressed will be vindicated, the poor will be vindicated. It means that Israel will be established as the nation on earth. It means the Messiah, the, the Davidic king, will come and establish his reign. It means that the Gentiles will be converted and come to the one true and living God. It means that the entire creation, as we were just talking about, the entire creation will be redeemed and brought into the kingdom and be even better than it was in, in Eden, uh, that it will far surpass paradise. So this day of the Lord is a very, you know, it's two or three words, but it includes a shorthand for so much uh, that's going on. And this, this day will come like a thief in the night, which is a very common, um, Jesus uses it, and it's a very common idea, which, he, it's, you know, it just means be ready. You should always be ready just in case because you don't know when it's going to happen. And it doesn't matter whether you're dead or alive, uh, he says. Um, <clears throat> you're, you're both going to be in the same boat uh, when this happens. Um, and he, he goes on to say in verses uh, uh, in 9, 10, 11, for God uh, did not appoint us to wrath. Jesus didn't come to condemn people, but he came to save people. Uh, he came to obtain the salvation for us through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, whether we are dead or alive, we should live together with him. So therefore, exhort one another, remind each other of this, and build each other up, uh, even as you already do, but just keep building each other up. Um, and he goes on to say in, uh, in verses 16 and 17, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, uh, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus toward you. Uh, you, you hear these phrases uh, a lot. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Um, and sometimes they're even used like baseball bats to hit people over the head. You should feel happy because Paul said, you should rejoice always. And it has nothing to do with feeling happy, not at all. Uh, to rejoice uh, is, a, is, a, is a choice. It's not necessarily an emotion. It's a choice, it's, a, it's an attitude. And it's the same word that uh, Gabriel greets the Virgin Mary with uh, at the Annunciation. The, um, in Greek, he says, rejoice, O virgin, full of grace. The Lord is with you. And then in the garden, when Mary Magdalene meets Jesus for the first time, his first words to her, his first word to her is, rejoice. Uh, 
Now, in both cases, you might think, well, clearly that means be happy because in those, both those circumstances, happiness, being happy would be the natural attitude. But it's happy comes and goes. To rejoice is a much more consistent, much more stable, uh, enduring attitude. And it's a, it's, a, it's a thing that you can choose to do. You can choose to rejoice. Um, so that this is really the, what St. Paul is saying, rejoicing should be a fundamental attitude of the Christian life, not necessarily feeling happy, but you should, because of the incarnation and the resurrection, so you know, to say rejoice always is hearkening back to those two episodes um, of the Annunciation and Christ in the Garden with St. Mary Magdalene. Yes. Where? Yes, I'm mean, very interested, uh, kind of, Stephen, what um, some of these terms that we, we were just talking about, the idea of the thief in the night and rejoice, because those are terms which show up in the Gospels. Of course, Thessalonians was written before any of the Gospels. And I'm just curious if actually the words in Greek that show up in the Gospels are the same exact same words that Paul uses in Thessalonians, or whether or not translators have just tried to jigger it to make them the same. No, it's, 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 it is, it's the same. It's the same word, you know, in the grammatically proper form. Okay. So you know, so what what's you know, what's an injunction in one case is maybe an adverb somewhere else, but it's the same right. word. Right. It's just curious because I it, that suggests, of course, then that the the what's in some of the texts in the Gospels are sort of based upon, I guess, tr Christian teachings and traditions that had been around for a long time before the Gospels were written. Oh, clearly, the, the stories were being passed around for, I mean, the, the, the right. Blessed Virgin told people what happened, and Luke interviewed her and wrote down the story, but he's not the only one she talked to. It was common right. knowledge what had happened, and she, yeah, she, she told people, and, and they knew uh, after, after, the, after Pentecost, that became just part of the common Christian understanding of things. It, it seems to me that rejoicing is a, an appropriate attribute for the Christian life because you can rejoice at the same time you're actually sad. It's completely not happy. You can be sad and yet still rejoice. Uh, people of faith who lose those they love can be sad that they're gone but rejoice that they're with God. So it seems to me that a, a, a faith such as Christianity that's built on a crucifix, a crucified and risen Lord, um, rejoicing is very appropriate. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's redemption. Yeah. It's the happiness that comes with knowing that, that you've, you've, you've made it. Yeah. And it's, yeah, not, and you, and it's not due to you. <laughs> yeah. But you, you've already got one foot in the next camp. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're already halfway there. Um, one of the ways you, you get halfway there is the other thing St. Paul says, to pray without ceasing. Uh, that became a very popular saying, especially in Eastern Christianity, uh, where people you know, asked, well, how do, we, how, do, how do you pray without ceasing? And um, the whole idea of, is called hesychasm, of people saying what's called the Jesus prayer, which is a phrase from the gospel, Jesus, son of God, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. I think we heard Bartimaeus say that same thing in the, or we will hear him on Sunday. We heard him on Monday afternoon say it at the Emmaus walk, we heard him say that, but we will hear him say it on Sunday morning. Um, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the, re the, the, the repetition of that phrase uh, becomes a very foundational text in Eastern Christianity and spiritual practice. And in the 18th century, of uh, a book you may be familiar with called The Way of the Pilgrim, which is an anonymous book, a diary by a Russian peasant who goes around uh, to various spiritual teachers uh, to ask advice about saying the Jesus prayer and how to pray without ceasing. And then Americans often know about it through Franny and Zui where it's mentioned, I think, uh, I confess I have not read Franny and Zui, so I'm not sure how big a part of the story it is. Maybe, oh, it's central. A, it's central, okay. Yes. So, it's a, so Americans should know about this. <laughs> um, but I, I think in the West also, there's the, the brother Lawrence who, who wrote about practicing the presence of God and uh, about how to be aw constantly aware of God 
that prayer doesn't necessarily need to be words that you're always talking about. And the same way with the Jesus prayer, it just becomes part of the way you breathe eventually if you do it right. So that just as you breathe, you are communicating with God. And Brother Lawrence was talking about just being aware constantly that God is there and that you're communicating with him just because of your awareness. So both, both the East and the West do take this injunction to pray without ceasing very seriously and, and have um, ways to approach it and, 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 and ways to, to think about it and, and try to make it a part of um, your, your life. And it really, so that, it be, so that the awareness of God really becomes second nature to you so that you are constantly praying, you are constantly aware of God's presence. It's a lot MC. like mantra repetition. It's a lot like mantra repetition. I mean, that yes. is mantra repetition. Yeah, yeah people but, have called it Christian you know, In mantras. a different, yeah. Yeah. Uh, St. Paul then goes, so he, this is towards the end of chapter five. So it's like his, his handy dandy short suggestions for how to live all wrapped up together. Uh, he then, he also says, um, don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies, test all things, and hold firm to that which is good. So he's saying, test the prophets. You know, believe the prophets, but test the prophets. So the, these prophets, the, these really great preachers that are um, in different places, he says, should be tested. How do you test a prophet? How do you test a preacher? Well, again, in the Dedicate, from about this same time, um, this handbook for how to run a parish, it says that if a prophet shows up, welcome him, put him up even, give him food, listen to what he has to say. If he stays more than three days, don't believe a word he said. Prophets can come, they can, you should put them up, pay attention to them for one day, two days, even three days. But if they stay a fourth day, forget it. They're just moochers. They're just trying to, 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 uh, take advantage of you. Don't believe a word they said if they stay a fourth day. So that's one of the ways to test the prophets, to test these inspired preachers. So St. Paul also makes the point that he always worked for a living. He never took money from anybody while he was preaching. After he left a place, he was happy to write back and say, please send me money because I need it for something, For I need it for a project. But while he was there, he never asked people for money. He, so that's, if you, have a, if you have a prophet in your parish, someone who lives in the city, he's not, he doesn't show up and you know, you're not gonna throw somebody out of, after three days if he lives there. So, but if somebody lives in your parish and is working, has a job and supporting himself, then he's a prophet. And then, then he passes the test for profit. But if it's somebody who may have grown up there, may live there, but if he gives up his work and he expects you to pay for him, to pay for, you know, to, to forget it. You know, any, any prophet who wants you to support him is no prophet. Um, so, yes, Debbie, you're, you're muted. Debbie, you're muted. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, no. Okay. Uh, I was just looking for the right button. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, for work. Um, what did um, St. Paul do besides writing letters and, and he made and tents. being a prophet? What did he do? He made tents. Oh. So he, he, he kept uh, sporting goods stores supplied, places like Patagonia <laughs> and um, Dicks. places like that. Yeah. yeah. So he, uh, he made tents and his, his two best buddies, Priscilla and Aquila, were also tent makers. So... Hmm. That's, um, and they probably weren't little tiny tents. They were like big. Big tents. Pavilions, like, yeah. wedding pavilions, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So they would be that a big- That was very room. common, that was not uncommon profession in those days. Well, I guess there was a bigger demand for tents back then yes. than today. Yes. They're like Toll Brothers or something. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so if, you, so if you had a prophet who supported himself that was then you that that was fine and, and usually a prophet would be like a bishop because the bishop would and, contri the, the, and contributed to the community. I just have to say that. Yes, yeah, he, he didn't, didn't come to the worshiping community. Yes, 
yeah, it's somebody who, who, who's, who put into the common pot and contributed to the collection. But usually the bishops were the ones who preached. And so the, the prophet, the prophet um, is another way of talking about the bishop in a lot of cases. So you have, so what you wouldn't want is a wandering bishop who shows up and stays for more than three days because that's really dangerous. Um, I think we still feel that way. <laughs> we don't want wandering bishops oh, to just no. show up. <laughs> then uh, St. Paul goes on to say, um, uh, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Uh, in verse 26, greet all the brethren with a, not just a kiss, but with a holy kiss. And I solemnly command you, I command you by the Lord, he's taking a little authority on himself, I command you that, that this letter be read to all the holy brethren. And this is the, like, he's added this little part because he realizes that people are passing around the letters. And then the last verse is, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, this holy kiss is the liturgical uh, exchange of the peace, that the kiss of peace was a really important part of the Eucharist from the very, very beginning, uh, as far as all our records go, so that the, the fundamental parts of the Eucharist were the, 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 the preaching, the prayers, the kiss of peace, and the consecration and communion of, of the holy gifts. And that was the, and you, you could not receive communion if you didn't share the kiss of peace. And if you shared the kiss of peace, then you were, expect, then that would hand it, you were going to receive communion. So if you, if you couldn't do one, you couldn't do the other. So that if you were going to receive communion, you couldn't be, you couldn't share in the kiss either. It went hand in hand. Yes. Was it, was it just a regular kiss or was it like two cheeks or was it? Well, in, in Greece, it was two cheeks In other, other places it was it's three times. Um, it's, it's the, the, the kiss is the, the, the shape of the kiss can be kind of culturally determined, okay. but, but the point is that it's a kiss and that it was really scandalous. That's what led because non-Christians couldn't see this part of the service because they were going to receive communion. Therefore they had to, they couldn't be there for the kiss of peace. They just heard stories about strangers kissing each other. And that gave rise to all the accusations of incest and orgies going on at the Eucharist because Romans did not kiss people who were not family. That was, that was just, you didn't do that. Uh, Italians now kiss everybody. The French kiss everybody. But in those days, a good Roman did not kiss anyone that was not part of the family. So these stories that they heard through the grapevine that, you know, mangled, twisted versions of what, and, you know, the, all, all the talk about the body and blood of Christ, that gave rise to the stories about cannibalism. And they did all the horrendous things that the Christians were accused of come out of, because no, the non-Christians couldn't see what was going on. So they just heard about it. And this, the, the kiss gave rise to all the stories of sexual immorality among the Christians. The first part, I just want to add, just add here something about the liturgy. The first part of the liturgy, everyone who wanted to could, could attend, and that would be the reading of the scripture and the sermon. But when they were ready to move forward into the holy meal, you know, what that where we would, uh, like the offertory, Everyone in the public assembly who had not been baptized, including the, the catechumens, would be dismissed. So during right. the by the time they had the holy kiss and the communion, only the baptized would be there. Right. In some places, the holy kiss came right around, right at the offertory. In some places, the holy kiss came right before communion. But in both cases, the non-Christians would have been dismissed, um, and, the, and the doors the doors locked. And the rule was that if you missed church for three weeks in a row, you were excommunicated because people couldn't be trusted. You couldn't be trusted anymore. The next time you showed up, you might be bringing the police uh, and everybody and would get arrested. The fact that, that only the initiates could stay added to the rumors, I guess, yes. they were, that they were doing something you know, it has, to, it has to, there has to be something terrible going on if they don't yeah. want anybody to see. So this, this last verse, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Be, now, this is the first letter St. Paul wrote. 
but this 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 sentence becomes his standard closing, uh, and the problem is, is that this term race becomes so misunderstood that I think nowadays we'd be better off just not to ever use it because people have such screwed up ideas about what grace means. So many times people think grace means it's, it's like some kind of shining ooze or some kind of glowing stuff in a needle that God gives you a shot of. And then you're like Superman for 10 minutes and you can do anything. And then the ooze dissipates and you're just back to being a normal person. Um, grace is not that at all. Grace, is, the word grace in Greek means a favor or a gift. It means a kindness. It can also mean life. So to, um, grace uh, uh, it becomes synonymous with charity. Who is one of the, who is one of the, um, the, the graces, the, the goddesses who, who bestow benevolent gifts on the human race. So this whole idea of you know, God give us the grace to do X, Y, or Z is a total misunderstanding. Grace is not something that you, uh, like it's not the opposite of kryptonite. Uh, it's just a favor that, that it's, 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 it's always there. To say the grace of God be with you just means, it's like to pray without ceasing. Just be aware that you're surrounded by the gift of, by the gift of God. That, that you are enveloped by the life that God has, has shared with you. Um, it's a, grace is like, it can be also like another name for the second person of the Trinity. Let grace come and the world pass away. We read in, in some early uh, texts like the Didache. It just means, you know, the presence of God. So that's my sermon about don't use the word grace. <laughs> Um, any questions? We've got like, what is it? Six minutes. Well, I think we, we piped up when we had something. <laughs> I think in the Episcopal tradition, grace is usually, uh, I, I don't know, I can't really speak for everybody, but my impression has been that most people consider it uh, a way of speaking about God's help and presence. You know, as opposed to a sort of a product. Yeah, right. I hope. So. Yeah, I hope so. For me, it feels like a blessing, just a, mm -hmm. a, a, a sense of of being blessed. Yeah. Right. Even the word blessing, I think, um, is very. You know, the word in Greek it means to say it means a good word. To bless something means to say something good about this yeah. thing. So that when we say, um, you know. Uh, ask the priest to bless something, we're asking the priest to say something good about this thing that tells us how it's, how it's related to God. Mm. And so if we ask for God's blessing, we're asking him, you know, say something good to us about how we are related to you. Yes, and if you want to see that definition really quite um, clearly acted out, just read the blessings that go with liturgical uh, furniture. When you bless a pulpit, uh, uh, you talk about what's done at the pulpit. When you bless a, a baptismal font, or rather, more correctly, ask God to bless it, you talk about what's going on at the baptismal font, or the credence table, or the, you know, the altar cloth, or whatever it is that's being set apart. Right, and if if you if you all pick up your prayer book and find the, the service for the consecration of the church, that's where you find these these prayers for the for the blessing of pulpits and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So say to to say a good word. So like, even if we ask the priest to bless the food uh, at dinner time, you know, say something good about the food that tells that tells us nourishes what, that this food that, nourishes. That, that, you hear that, that the food a lot. is good. The purpose of the food is to nourish us, and so that's part of the blessing often. Yeah, tell us something good about the food and, and how it reveals, how it connects us to God. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I think that kind of yeah. it's interesting about this, as you're saying, um, Father Morris, about the misunderstanding about sort of grace. And I know um, the translation that I have, I have the um, David Bentley Hart translation. Yay. And he, 
he stresses in the, his introduction, and I think this is a view of consensus New Testament scholars, that later uh, Christians, especially the Protestant reformers, really misread St. Paul about grace and works. They completely totally, misunderstood totally. grace and works, right? They just completely got it wrong about yeah. what, 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 what St. Paul was talking about, about grace and works. And I think a lot of scholars have said the problem is St. Paul was writing the idea that Christianity and Judaism were two separate religions just sort of didn't kind of exist at the time. And that there were many, many believers were either of Jewish background like Paul or were very familiar with, with Judaism or stuff. And that the later Christians, especially in the, the medieval ages and the Renaissance had no sense about that. And so, yes. when, and so when Paul was talking about the grace works distinction, they you know, read something different. They read something very different into it. Right. That's right. very helpful, Larry. And yeah. if anybody wants me to photocopy David Bentley Hart's introduction, I yeah. and send it to them. I'd be happy to do that because it's yeah. it's really it's really good. Yeah, that would be a very handy PDF if there was a link. Mm -hmm. if, you know, the same place that it, if we post the um, recording, the link to see the recording. If there's a link yeah. to, to see the PDF of that yeah. introduction. Yeah, that'd be good to see. Yeah, just just what so you, you need. Give us a headline about. John, now are you going to move to the second letter of Thessalonians? I don't want to cut anybody off, but I just want to get a headline about next week. Will oh, you next week, the next second week letter? We, will, we will do the second letter, and we're going to focus on chapter two, which is all about the Antichrist. Oh, um, good. And, oh, well, all kinds of interesting stuff, because there's tons of stuff about the, not just tons of stuff in the letter about the Antichrist. So we're going to get into tons of early Christian stuff about American the Antichrist. Politics. <laughs> Them too. No, wouldn't you? <laughs> but no, but there's tons of stuff about uh, the Antichrist in uh, the second, third, and fourth, fifth centuries that uh, helps helps illuminate what Saint Paul is talking about in the Second Thessalonians. Good. I really look forward to that because I think that the, the his 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 writings about the Antichrist can seem very uh, very even more formal of foreign than some of mm. these other concepts. So I'm glad you're going to walk us through that. I hope all of you can come back next week. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Father Morris. Thank you. Thank you. Take Bye, care. Bye. 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 Bye.